I will be talking about scaling in uh, complex systems. And um, well, the outline, I, um, scaling is sort of a very broad topic. So I try to include uh, both like a general idea of what scaling is and uh, how scaling exists in uh, complex systems, but also in other types of examples um, the, uh, in field, sorry. Then um, I will spend maybe more time in scaling in, in statistics. So uh, the first part of the, of the talk is also, is also a bit more general. Um, then I will uh, talk about how to generate power laws, which are the classical um, distribution for uh, scaling laws in statistics. And uh, I will uh, talk more about this, uh, sorry, uh, sample space reducing processes, which are, um, which I found were a bit more uh, recent and, uh, and is a very interesting way of uh, generating power law distributions. And um, if there's time in the end, I will talk about uh, Kleiber's law, which is uh, uh, sort of a result that happens in biology uh, and how, how it's related to, uh, to the structure of <laughs> living organisms in a way. But yeah, so um, the most common way of talking about scaling theory is uh, by starting with uh, Galileo Galilei's uh, description of scaling, right? And so what Galileo noticed what was that um, when you double the length of, a, of an animal, for instance, then uh, its mass is increased uh, in a cubic manner. So if you double this, uh, the length, then the mass needs to be eight times this. And then he also noticed that, um, that if you, that this relationship does not hold for the structure of bones. So the strength of a bone is only quadratic uh, with respect to the radius of the bone. So um, in the end, the, the relationship that he found was that uh, the radius of the bone needs to scale uh, uh, in the power of three quarters to the length of the bone, which in a way, it means that this very thin bone turns into a, this very clunky piece of bone in, um, in, in larger animals, which he explained was uh, why larger animals such as elephants, for instance, seem to be uh, uh, way more, uh, in a way, clumsy when moving. But so um, that was the first, well, one of the first recorded cases, but uh, scaling relationships exist in, in many different fields. So what is a scaling relationship? So basically uh, X and F of X are uh, in a sca uh, scaling relationship. If when you stretch or squeeze x by lambda, then f of lambda x is also stretched or squeezed in a way. So this happens uh, as a function of uh, as a function of lambda, but this uh, the the this scaled version of the function is also proportional to the original f of x, and um, there are the general way to uh, to describe this relationship is by power loss. So it's basically just taking uh, x and putting it to the power of c. Um, this um, th there's other ways of uh, maintaining these relationships, uh, especially with periodic functions. But in general, when you're talking about scaling, you're talking about powers or or power loss, and uh, of course. Um, uh, these scaling relationships are very common in many other fields. So for instance, uh, Newton's law of gravity is also a scaling relationship on the radius. Um, so if you have uh, two, two masses, then the, um, the force between these two masses is uh, scales inversely proportionally to the square of the distance between these two um, masses. Um, Scaling also appears in biology. Um, of course, uh, Galileo's example was so, so, sort, of, sort of the basic uh, cases, but this uh, relationship known as Cliver loss 
Kleber's law was also one uh, a very big development in the last century. And um, basically it links the metabolic rate of, a, of an animal or of a living organism. So the metabolic rate is the amount of energy that uh, the organism consumes per hour. Um, and it's related to the mass of the animal. And um, this, was very uh, this was very striking uh, when it was first uh, discovered in the, uh, in the past uh, century. So I think it, it was in the 1920s. That, uh, because um, this relationship seemed to hold in a very uh, large uh, degree of, of animals. So in a way it holds for very small living cells and it also holds for uh, medium or small animals such as frogs, but then it also holds for elephants. And so um, uh, this was one of the ma uh, major uh, developing points of scaling theory uh, in the past century. And um, I, I will talk more about this uh, at the end of the at the end of the seminar, but um, but yeah, the, the main idea is that scaling uh, exists in many in many different um, fields. Now, um, when it's come um, when it comes to scaling to scaling in statistics, the main way to talk about it is via power laws, right? So it's this form of distribution where the probability of observing an event is inversely proportional to, to, the, to the event. So um, there are many, uh, I mean, uh, this sort of distributions can take uh, many different flavors. So uh, for instance, the Pareto distribution, which was originally used to describe uh, income, um, uh, usually starts at uh, at a lower uh, well it, it starts being described or defined at this xm um, then a, a more general way of talking about scaling loss is uh, talking about the scaling of simply the tail of the distribution so the largest numbers of uh, of the distribution and so you usually talk about a slow varying function that when you have a really large x, then uh, this uh, the scaling law dominates. Um, one also very common way to talk about uh, scaling laws is uh, Sipp's law. So this was uh, sort of like an empirical found, uh, finding again in the last century in linguistics. And it was basically that um, this person Sipp found that the frequency of words uh, decayed uh, in an inversely proportional manner. So um, of course, this is a harmonic series. So if S is one, which was the original Sipp's law, uh, then um, this diverges. So this is uh, def uh, delimited in, in, a, in a way, like in a, in a range of values. But um, more generally speaking, uh, when you talk about Sipp's law, you usually talk uh, about this specific relationship where the probability is just inversely proportional to, to x. Um, so um, um, this distribution is very interesting because in many ways, the moments of the distributions uh, do, uh, do not exist. So if you're looking, well, in some cases do not exist, but so uh, the moment of the distribution uh, is defined uh, in this manner. So it's simply take, uh, looking at all the values that a function can take. And uh, if you're looking for the nth moment, you just multiply the probability uh, for, uh, for this value. And um, basically you need to take the limit because uh, of this because otherwise you cannot define it. And um, what you find is that there is an interesting relationship between the exponent of the distribution and the, and the moment that you want to take. So basically this relationship needs to hold for the, mo uh, for the nth moment to exist. Uh, otherwise it diverges to infinity, which you can see here. Um, this needs to be uh, smaller than zero. Otherwise, when this goes to infinity, 
uh, the whole thing goes to infinity. And um, this, uh, in a way, when you're talking about scale freeness in probability distributions, um, this uh, this can mean a lot of things in um, in 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 the literature. So. In the broad sense, you're talking about the scaling relationship that I mentioned at the beginning. But in other sense, uh, it, it, ha it has also been referred about talking about an internal scales of what you can describe. So usually, for instance, if you have a, if you have a, a first and a second moment, so if you, have, uh, if you can define the mean and the standard deviation, you can, in a way, encompass most of the values with the mean and with a standard deviation. If, for instance, you have this type of relationship where alpha is between two and three, then the standard deviation uh, doesn't exist. And it's really hard to talk about where the values are located. And that's what you talk about uh, at an internal scale. Um, so, um, for instance, uh, an example of this is what, when you're looking at the heights of people. And so you usually uh, expect people to, uh, to be, uh, people's height to be in a way in a certain range of values. And of course, people's height vary, but uh, it doesn't vary that much. So when you're talking about the height of people, then you usually expect to see a distribution that looks sort of like this, where extremely, um, where very large or very small values are basically unobserved. And this doesn't happen with uh, scaling relationships. So uh, with a power law distribution, um, for instance, most of the mass might be here, but then the mean of both uh, of this distribution is all the way here. And, um, and this is why, uh, when you, why, why you would talk about scale freeness in this uh, sense, like in, in this moment sense, because you cannot talk about uh, how things behave in general uh, or where you expect things to be. Um, um, yes. So, uh, yes, the heights of people are not scale-free in a sense. But um, this type of uh, relationships have been described in many places. So, for, uh, as I mentioned before, the uh, work frequencies were found, were, were described to be a power law uh, in linguistics. Then, um, a citation networks have also been found to have uh, power law distributions, or the, in social networks, the telephone, uh, well, the number of telephone calls received. And then, um, in uh, geology, the magnitude of earthquakes is also, also found, found to be uh, a power law distribution. And, um, and so uh, basically, uh, this type of relationship has been described in many, in many places. Um, this is, however, very controversial because it, it, in a way it is related to, <laughs> to a, in the beginning, just seeing a straight line in a log-log plot and seeing, okay, so this is a linear relationship in a log-log plot, so this is a power law. And, um, and particularly during the last 20 years, it has been very contentious uh, in, in network science, um, basically because a, a lot of the models, our theoretical models, uh, have a, uh, power law distribution, for instance, in the degree, which is a scale-free network. Um, however, when you look at data and you conduct statistical tests to see, okay, so is this a power law or is this some other distribution? It could be a log normal or, or something else. Um, then uh, this relationship, well, well, power laws might not necessarily be the best fit for, for data. Um, and uh, yeah, the reality is that uh, it's hard to tell uh, whether uh, a distribution is a power law or not. And in a way, it's a whole field of study. And uh, some of the people in the research group of complex systems are working on fitting power laws or uh, with uh, scale-free networks. Um, so I, I will not be talking about, uh, about it a lot. But uh, so some of the problems that happen with these things is that... Uh, with power laws, as we saw, you're talking about extreme values, which can be 
uh, tricky to handle. Then you have this difference of uh, whenever you have data, it has to be finite, but uh, the models that we're using it are infinite. So in a way, this sort of distortion can have problems when you're fitting power loss. Then of course, there's, uh, there might be sampling errors. And uh, as, as I mentioned before, some statistical distributions might, might be very similar. Um, and uh, so I, I will talk about, uh, about this more. But uh, for instance, log normal distributions can appear uh, very similar in many ways, uh, both in generating mechanisms to, of the distributions, but also in, the, in how the distributions look. Um, so basically here, we have a log normal distribution um, and a power law. So a distribution is log normal if its logarithm uh, is distributed in a normal way or as a Gaussian. And um, when you plot both of these things in a log-log plot, both of them can look like a straight line, which can seem very confusing. In this case, for instance, I'm uh, plotting uh, a log-normal distribution, which has a variance five and uh, mean 10. And... Um, um, yeah, uh, and yeah, the thing is that uh, when you are when you look at how these like analytical distributions look like, uh, a log normal in the log log case is basically a straight line. However, um, um, sorry, a, a power law is a straight line, but a log normal can be quadratic in the log log case. So if the variance is really large then this expression uh, is, becomes almost linear. Um, this whole expression, uh, well, this can go very close to zero and uh, this dominates, which is in a way the linear part of the relationship. Um, analytically, however, these things are very different because as we saw, uh, the moments of this distribution might not exist, whether this distribution is much more stable. Um, however, so, this is uh, how, how prevalent uh, not only scale-free networks, but power loss in general, uh, how, how common they are can be very uh, a tricky thing. But the thing is that when you are modeling thing, things, uh, these distributions occur a lot. So in a way, uh, what I'll be talking about more is uh, how, um, how log norm, uh, sorry, how power loss can come, can come to be in many different ways uh, from a statistical perspective. Um, yeah, so um, to generate power laws, you can have a wide range of uh, generating mechanisms. Um, I, I'll be talking about a few of them, but uh, this is definitely not an exhaustive uh, list. But um, yeah, so... Um, one of the main things that, uh, well, that drove to the knowledge of uh, this type of behavior was uh, critical phenomena. This is, of course, what Abbas was talking about uh, a few weeks ago. But uh, it's what happens when you have, uh, when you're transiting from one uh, state to another. Um, but, well, uh, this was covered last week. Then there's also a thing of uh, self-organized criticality. Uh, this will be a talk by itself uh, by Celia next week. But um, basically the idea is that you have a system that drives itself to a critical state. So this is usually, a, um, well, the most simple model to describe this is uh, when you have uh, grains of sand and you're dropping them and you're dropping them. And then at some point you see that avalanches start to appear. Um, so this, uh, the size of avalanches uh, can be described as a power law distribution. Then um, also one of the most common ways to describe uh, power law generating mechanisms is uh, preferential attachment. So um, this type of models were described also widely, especially in the last century. And um, it was this, uh, used to describe, well, the main idea of preferential attachment is that um, you have a generating mechanism and you can get more, uh, 
more depending on what you already have. So if you're looking at uh, the degree distribution, for instance, then um, you get more nodes depending on the degree that you, uh, of your current degree. So uh, in a way, this sort of mechanism um, can lead to this sort of uh, structure when you, where you have hops, uh, which are these nodes uh, with, the very, very, with extremely large uh, degrees. Uh, whereas most, most uh, not nodes don't have, uh, well, have our degree one or two. And um, this was started, for instance, uh, originally to describe how species are distributed in uh, different types of genera of plants. So if you have uh, uh, one genera of plants, there's, uh, there's mutations going on. And so if there's already a lot of species in this type of genera of plants, then there's a higher probability that uh, these species will differentiate and will create more species. Um, this, um, or in case of citation, citation networks, for instance, it is described in a sense that, okay, so uh, you have this paper that has already been cited. And so this other citation leads to this uh, paper having, uh, well, leads to the probability of running into this paper uh, being higher. And so um, citation networks start growing in the sense that a few papers start gaining, uh, might start gaining a lot of attention. Of course, this can be more complicated processes, but uh, this sort of mechanism has been used to describe this. Um, sorry. Um, but so, as, uh, as I was talking, uh, saying before, the log normal distribution and the power law distribution can be, uh, in a way, um, are, linked, uh, are linked in many ways, and this can also be through a, a generating mechanism. So um, here we have a multiplicative process, and so it's basically, you have a random variable that uh, is either shrinking or expanding depending on a previous state. Um, this can be, for instance, uh, used in biology to show, to talk about population growth, or this has been used uh, about uh, for, for uh, pricing models in economics. Um, but the main idea is that it is relatively easy to see how this, uh, this sort of phenomena might lead to a log, log normal distribution. So if you take the logarithm of this side and the logarithm of this other side, then you end up with this sum of the random variables which have a finite min and, uh, and a standard deviation. And uh, this is basically just the central limit theorem which says that this is Gaussian. And so as we saw, if the logarithm of a distribution is, uh, is uh, Gaussian, then the distribution is log normal. So this process uh, can be log normal for a, for a wider range of, uh, of uh, functions f. However, very small deviations from this model lead to power loss. And uh, so this is a very interesting thing. So if you say, okay, so the variables need to have a lower bound, so they cannot go beyond the limit, um, then the distribution is a power law. Uh, and this lower bound can be implemented in many ways. So for instance, you can have a reflective property that says, okay, if I go, uh, if X is smaller than C, then X, uh, you just reflect it uh, according to C. It can, it can also be noise. And uh, this very simple mechanism uh, deviates log normals into power loss. Um, also, if you have, for instance, a collection of multiplicative processes, so um, this model, for instance, you can assume that you have uh, a collection of cities that are evolving in time. And so these cities might be growing or they might be shrinking. And you don't necessarily need to say that the cities are linked, but you, what you only say is that the population across cities is uh, constant. And so this all this uh, very simple mechanism also leads to power laws in the, the, in the population of cities. Um, here is also the reference uh, underneath. Um, another mechanism that you can have 
is for instance, if you have uh, an exponential process. So here, um, this, uh, this process is just, um, you have time here and uh, the process basically follows um, this distribution here. And what is uh, interesting is that if you observe this process also in, um, in an exponential manner, um, then the process itself might look like, uh, well, turns into a power law, even if the process is not, uh, is not exponential. Uh, sorry, it's not a power law. So uh, in a way, this generates the idea that it depends also how, for instance, the sampling or uh, the observation might generate a power law in a statistical sense. Um, now, um, sample space reducing processes are uh, quite uh, interesting because it's a way of modeling things in the sense that history will matter. So um, you can think, think of it, for instance, as a fragmentation process, right? So if you're looking at the sites, as the sizes of rocks um, and you're looking at this rock that is uh, making smaller. So this rock can uh, turn into a lot of different smaller rocks, but once you have a smaller rock, you cannot go back. So you need to, like, the only way is that it either stays the same or it becomes smaller. Also, you can think about it as when you're uh, creating sentences. So when you are starting a sentence, then you have a wide array of, of uh, processes, of, of, of words that you might choose. However, when you pick a, a word, then uh, this word might usually be followed by a smaller set of words. So um, this idea of history matters is once you have observed something, then the, the, sample, the following sample space is, uh, is reduced. So um, this is... Uh, uh, a very basic model that I will talk about more um, extensively. But uh, the idea of this model of the sample space reducing uh, process is uh, you have a ball that is falling down the stairs. So in this basic setup, you, uh, you start in the, highest, uh, in the highest step, and then you might fall with equal probability to any of the other steps. And once you have fallen, then you cannot go back. And uh, you can only fall in the two steps that are smaller than you. And um, as we will see, this generates a power law. But um, uh, this model can be very interesting because it generalizes in uh, very interesting ways. So one of the generalizations, for instance, would be with a random noise, you might go back to the back of the state uh, of the stairway and you will start falling again. Um, and another way of generalizing it is, would be to say, um, you, when you fall into a stair, you in a way fragment. Uh, and so you, you become uh, two different balls that are falling, right? So this is known as a cascading process. Um, and what we find is that all of this uh, turn into power loss. And so this turns into a sig law, which means that uh, this is just uh, inversely proportional. Um, when you have this uh, noise of going back to the initial state, then you generate in a way uh, a more general way of having power loss. And then if you have a, uh, but within lambda, well, with lambda between zero and one, because this is a probability, but if you have a, cas a cascading process, uh, then you also have a power law, but this is a more general way of a power law because this generates the full range of exponents. Um, so I will talk about the whole, um, about how this works in the, the basic setup. And um, so, as I said, the, the setup is that you have a ball on the top and then you jump to any of the states with equal probability. Um, and when you reach one, you repeat this, the, the process. So basically, you can just describe this with a conditional probability. And it's uh, basically, if you are in state J, 
then you can jump to any i with, uh, with equal probability with depends on j. Um, and so when, when you want to see what is the probability in the end of visiting all the states, you can simply see uh, the law of total probability. So uh, you, you see what is the, pro uh, the conditional probability that we saw before and the probability of being in that state. And um, this can be very easily, well, the difference of these two states can be very, well, easily rewritten in this way by following this probability. So basically this expression can be rewritten as a differential equation. And uh, this is very easy to solve. And uh, what, what we have is that this derivation basically yields that the probability is, uh, is a SIPS law. Um, so I, I was talking about generalizations before, but there's even more generali generalizations of uh, what can happen. So you can have a prior distribution of, um, of uh, visiting the different steps. So you might want to say, okay, so visiting the step in the middle is way higher. Or um, if you're talking, uh, for instance, uh, about diffusion on networks, then you might talk about uh, this probability being, uh, being the degree of a node. Um, and so um, what is really interesting about these generalizations is that for a very wide range of, uh, of, um, of prior distributions, then this becomes, uh, this becomes a SIPS law. So the exponent is just minus one. Um, so in the exercise that I prepared, you will see how, uh, which are the limits of this distribution, uh, of this prior distribution. Um, then if you have this noise that if it's minus one, this can be interpreted as noise, or if it's larger than one can be interpreted as a cascading process, then you generate any basic, any power law distribution. But then uh, things can get even more complicated if the noise uh, depends on the actual state that you're in. And um, this becomes really interesting because you can generate a whole family of statistical distributions if, you, if the noise depends on the state. So uh, for instance, if the noise is not constant, but uh, if it depends linearly on, uh, on the state, then the distribution actually turns to be exponential. Or you can have a, a, a wide variety of states and you end up having a, um, a lot of visiting distributions, which is, I think, a, a very interesting uh, and uh, powerful result. And uh, this has been, uh, this is quite uh, recent research as well. Um, so um, a, a very easy, um, well, an application of this sort of model, for instance, is um, if, you're, uh, have, if you have uh, random walkers on directed acyc uh, acyclic graphs, and um, basically what you will have is that this probability distribution uh, will follow, will be given by the um, matrix, matrix of edges. But uh, if you have a random network, then this very easily generalizes to, um, to, to uh, like a SIPS law that we saw before, or the very basic scenario that you have before. Then this can also be a bit more general because if you actually have cycles, then you can model this with a driving parameter that we mentioned before. So this parameter that uh, basically creates noise. And um, yeah, so uh, for the last part of the talk, I will be talking about uh, allometric scaling. So this is not related to what we, uh, to statistical approaches to scaling. But uh, this is, in a way, um, a sort of um, generating mechanism for uh, scaling relationships 
that takes uh, into account a lot of things about the biology and the structure of uh, living beings. So in a very general way, allometric scaling refers to um, properties of, in the, of uh, organisms being uh, related uh, to the mass of the organism in this sort of way. So you have uh, an exponent and uh, this is multiplied by a quarter. So um, this, this is a surprisingly general uh, relationship that happens, but uh, I will be talk ab talking about uh, the metabolic rate that uh, we saw in the beginning. So um, um, please hold with me because this is, uh, um, th this derivation is a bit, um, will be a bit superficial because it needs to take into account a lot of things, but uh, I will try to transmit the main idea. And so basically what we want to see, well, what we want to explain is this relationship where the metabolic rate is proportional to the mass of the organisms. And uh, as we saw in the beginning of the class, this uh, relationship is just uh, three quarters. So um, to see this, um, uh, you need uh, in a way some, uh, some assumptions, but uh, one of the main assumptions is that, well, the metabolic rate is proportional to the amount of nutrients that is transported uh, by the body. So in a way, if you have uh, an elephant, then uh, the metabolic rate is way higher. But what this is trying to explain is because its circulatory system is transporting and it needs to transport a uh, way higher uh, amount of nutrients. And so to see how this metabolic rate might be linked to, to mass, uh, we follow um, a, um, a few principles. Uh, a few principles regarding the network of the circulatory system. So um, the first principle is space filling. So this idea is that the circulatory network uh, needs to go to to capillaries on all the on all the body, right? So uh, it, this is basically a network that is branching out and bran branching out until it covers basically all the body or all the yeah. Then the other principle is size invariance. So um, this is basically for, for living organisms. Uh, the size invariance means that the capillaries are basically the same. So um, if you have um, basically a small mouse and you have an elephant, then the smallest, uh, the smallest capillaries are always, well, are relatively in the same size. And um, there's also a fractal network structure that uh, will become a bit important uh, when we talk about derivation. But um, yeah, so basically this, uh, this tries to schematize how the circulatory network works. And so as we said, the, uh, the size invariance means that in the end, um, all animals end up with the, with the highest level of capillaries. So in a way, like uh, you can think about it as a small animal having fewer branching, but uh, the, same, um, the same granularity of capillaries in a way. And with uh, higher, uh, well, bigger animals having um, uh, in, in a way more branching. Um, and then, I will not uh, go uh, very much into detail about this last part, but there's also uh, a relationship, well, about how this, uh, how, the, how the circulatory system works uh, in a way as, as tubes. So this, um, this fractal structure will be replicated in a way in the volume and in the length of, uh, of all this, um, of all these different branching levels. Um, but yeah, so basically what, uh, what we're talking about is that there will be a relationship between the radius of the tubes, the amount of uh, the velocity of the blood going through the tubes and the length of the tubes. 
And yeah, so uh, first we start saying that metabolism scales proportionally to the nutrient flow. And um, this is basically what we saw before. Uh, this is one of the first assumptions. Um, then there is another relationship which will talk that total, total flow is re related to the number of capillaries, right? So total flow in the highest level, which would be, for instance, here the aorta, is, is uh, the same as the total flow that goes in all the different levels. So if nk is the number of, uh, of branches that you have at the cave level, uh, the total flow should be equal to the... Yeah, the total flow in each branching should be uh, in a way proportional to the flow, well, to the total flow. And um, this goes all the way to the, to the last branching process. So basically what this is linking is the total flow of the nutrients in the body to the number of capillaries in the, in the network, well, in, in the body. Um, then um, there is another relationship, which um, this is probably the most complicated part of how to derive this. Um, but basically, this relates the network structure to, of the capilla, uh, to the volume of the blood going through the veins. And um, there, are, uh, there are a bunch of biological principles that try to explain why this happens. But it's basically, you don't want the blood to clot. So there are some uh, ideas of how things should flow in, in a certain network so that, um, so that you derive that this re relationship holds. So uh, it, the number of capillaries is related to the number of, to the volume of the blood uh, in, the, in the living things. And um, then the last thing is that there is, this a bit of an extra assumption that has also been proven empirically in a way that the volume of a body is a fraction of, uh, of the mass of an organism. So um, basically, of course, it means that um, the, the total volume of blood that is in a mouse will be a fraction of the mass of this mouse. And if you're talking about an ele elephant, the volume of the blood is a fraction of the mass of the ele elephant. But uh, basically, this is how you derive this scaling relationship. And uh, yes, this was my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Javier. Yeah, it was really interesting. Actually, I knew this, uh, the last result from some experimental point of view, but I had no idea how we can drive it. Uh, anyway, it was great. Thank you. Uh, I really enjoy it. So, are there any questions, guys? <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, I can ask something. Okay. Like with the um, so there's with this confusion that. Uh, with the, you can mi mix up the power loss with the log normal distributions, right? I mean, yeah. talking a bit about that. Uh, so doesn't this mean that, isn't this only for the kind of power law distributions that have exactly this exponent, uh, that is, I guess, minus one or something like this? Is this correct? Um, yeah. So th these are the only kind of, uh, uh, power loss you can mix up with the log normal. Um, um, I, I'm actually not sure about that. Um, I think that in a way you're also talking about the power law uh, falling in the, well, power law behavior also in the tail. So in a way this can also, um, this can be, uh, well, this kind of noise in a different manner. but. Uh, yeah, actually, I, I, I didn't think too much about it. But uh, yeah, the relationship that I showed uh, was only uh, with, uh, with power laws that have uh, 
exponent minus one. But uh, also in a way, when you're fitting power loss, uh, I mean, this is a whole area by itself, but when you're fitting power loss, there will be, of course, uh, some variation of the uh, exponent. So, well, some uncertainty regarding the exponent. So um, I um, didn't uh, read that much about uh, the statistical tests that go into fitting power loss and uh, and uh, comparing it with other distributions, such as no log normals. But uh, yeah, it might be. I'm not sure, to be honest. Yeah, I guess uh, because I'm, I'm working on this, like how yeah. to compare log normals and power loss. So it's a bit like you said, that if you're just looking at the tail, like you often are. So basically, for example, if you have sigma of the log normal distribution is like two or three, and you use, for example, these extreme value theory based tests that Voidalov uses, then uh, you get an exponent of like two or three. So it looks like a power law with exponent two or three, even though it doesn't really look like a straight line on okay. the log block. But. but then there should be some other tests that fix this. Yeah, I mean, it depends on, for example, if you use this clause, which Broida uses, then you get a bit different results, that's true. But it's difficult to find maybe tests that would not be too strict. Like, for example, the Broida test is really strict, but then if you have like some variation like you have often in the data, then it might fail that, um, even though the process generating the data might still be like a power law generating mechanism. So I guess it's the difficulty is in finding like a test which will not be too strict, but still uh, not like give you false positives. But yeah, if you have some uh, more ideas, I'm open to it since <laughs> this is what I'm trying to do. <laughs> no, I'm just like, I was also just, just wondering if like, because this is all, like often brought up that the log normal will look, look like a power law. But this only happens for power laws that have this particular exponent. So I'm just wondering how sensitive this is to the exponent. So if you have power law that is exponent minus three or minus two, for example, are you sort of safe? And it's not local normal process. Well, at least if you use like this extreme value based theory test, then you are not safe. <laughs> but but if you just draw it on a local block. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, well, maybe, but it, I guess the question is then that you have so many different kinds of, of distributions. So for example, so the stretched exponential might look like a power law. So it's difficult to find one test which would work for all the distributions, I guess. Okay, yeah, fine. So anecdotally, uh, my friend, uh, we are talking about something related to the power laws, and he said that, okay, if you plot, plot anything in a log log plot, it will look like a straight line. So this is just an anecdote from an electrical engineer. <laughs> well, not anything. Yeah. Well, practically anything. Anything that you might really encounter. Well, then he only encounters power laws. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um, are there other questions? I can ask more if <laughs> nobody else wants to ask. Uh, so Javier, like, uh, so you had this example of this, uh, this biological allometric scaling. Yeah. Did you encounter anything else, like other kind of things that would follow this? Um. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, what I liked about this was that uh, this allometric scaling was uh, basically linked to the network of the circulatory system. So uh, this is this is uh, very generalizable um, because, uh, yes, as I said, this is not only for uh, for metabolism, but it also follows for a, or for a wider range of uh, properties in living organisms, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's 
definitely other examples and uh, I have some literature about it. Also, for instance, in economics, I spent some time um, reading into some models that uh, try to explain things by a scaling. Uh, and of course, in physics, there's a lot of examples of, uh, of scaling, uh, both in the statistical sense and in the more uh, relationship or law kind of sense. But uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of literature. So can you give some examples, for example, in economics, what kind of things? <laughs> Allometric all scaling, I don't mean the uh, statistical scaling. Sorry, what? Uh, I mean allometric scaling in economics. Mm. No, um, I mean, I, I know it, I, I know some models do like have this sort of a relationship, but I, I mean, I, I was looking at them and I wasn't very convinced also because some things that were, for instance, about uh, pricing models and uh, stuff like that, which uh, especially in economics, uh, well, when I'm reading that, it feels like it's a bit speculative. So I, I cannot think of a specific example right now. But I guess you can also see it in the data, not only in the notes. Yeah, I mean, yeah, but I mean, especially, well, I think this plays into the discussion of uh, how, uh, how you can fit power loss in a way. And uh, I think uh, it's tricky to talk about this sort of relationship uh, in w when you're looking at the, at the data. So uh, what, what I think is that it's uh, interesting to try to explain this behavior by a, a generating mechanism, but especially probably in economics or in uh, sociology or stuff, uh, which has a lot of noise that may be really hard to capture. Um, well, it's uh, probably even harder to test, but um, sorry, I don't have a, an example. Okay. Is there any more questions? So if there is no more question, maybe we can have a 10 minute break and then come back to really.